now. Great. Well, fantastic. Thanks very much. I, uh, I'm, I'm really enthused to give this lecture today because I'm, I'm really passionate about the uh, importance and role that hardware can play in, um, in, in practice and allowing us to move things forward in terms of, of deep learning. And so what I want to go over today is, is sort of cherry pick a few of the key ideas, I think, that have been uh, very useful and influential in enabling us to scale up deep learning. Uh, and so, so what has basically happened over the, the past few years is there's there been a slow evolution of a very specific um, software stack that sits uh, and I guess includes frameworks that you're probably very familiar with, like PyTorch and TensorFlow. But then there is a, a huge amount of effort and work that goes underneath those frameworks um, in terms of system software, very low level um, uh, managers of resources. It's that sort of um, underplays all of this that enables um, all of the things that you hear and, and people talk about in terms of these large models being able to train, be trained um, so quickly. So essentially the, 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 the systems that I'm talking about today enable both deep learning to be practical in terms of production and then enable um, the sort of the very experimental sort of types of, of science in terms of deep learning to be, um, to be possible in sort of reasonable times in terms of exploration. Um, but I was inspired by Neil's uh, first lecture to sort of look back a little bit. Uh, and so hardware and, and, and deep learning have been sort of um, connected uh, really from almost day one. So if you go back uh, into the 50s, when it, there was even discussions of things like perceptrons, um, this, on the left-hand side here, this is an article from the New York Times in 1958. Um, not only are they talking about the model and what it's going to be able to achieve, but uh, to, to accomplish uh, the, the model, um, they also talk about the hardware. So they're talking about building, this is back in 58, talk about building a two million, this is US dollars, a computer specifically to run and scale up uh, perceptual models they had at that time um, to do tasks such as differentiate between left and right and, uh, and hopefully they, they expect to be able to have such a machine able to read and write in the next uh, year. And so something also to talk, caught my attention in this article that it was not that so sort of the sort of some of the claims that we see in, in deep learning that seem a bit, um, uh, a bit optimistic. They're not just a very recent phenomenon. They've been going on for a long time. And, um, and so some of the limitations that we have in bringing about many of these algorithms uh, extend from the hardware. And if you think about what we had available, say in the in the fifties, we had this ENIAC um, computer at that time um, that was using vacuum tubes, uh, hundred thousand cycles per second. So nothing like that we have today. And and, and this is really some of the the reasons why uh, it was so difficult for for um, some of these neural network ideas to take off at that time. Now, if we if we fast forward. A little bit. I think these are two really interesting um, slides to, to ground the discussion. On the right hand side, you can see, let me turn this drawing thing on. On the right hand side, uh, we see the advance of computing in terms of its uh, computational power since the early, uh, early 40s uh, to the 2010s. And see this, you see this uh, even march of, of progress. And there's a couple of things that I'll point out. One uh, is the very top of this uh, performance of, of these particular computers here in the 2010s actually corresponds to just barely being below what was necessary for early deep learning innovations like Linux to be even feasible. So it's not like that um, leading up to this time of seeing uh, these deep learning results uh, we never, it, it, it's, it's only until very recently that we had even the, the compute power available to build the types of architectures that, that really started this uh, revolution off. Uh, that's point number one. Um, point number two is that um, if we look at the things that have come after it, um, and we turn our attention to this figure here, uh, this figure is showing us all of these series of, of deep learning based results and speech and image. Um, they're plotted over the last uh, roughly 10 years. On the y-axis, we have a log scale of the, the flocks required to train each individual one. And so not only do we see that 
compute available for to uh, to support the very earliest forms of it was only available in, in since uh, 2010 moving forward. Uh, second of all, um, the because the gains here, the, the, we, what we see here is that the requirements needed for these are actually uh, doubling every three months. Now, on the on the right hand side, uh, the, the roughly the, the doubling of compute capacity is every eighteen months. So, if you had the line plotted here, it would be something more like this. And so, my point is that we've been able to pull off in the last ten years uh, a rate of increase in in, in uh, um, capacity to power these deep learning um, systems uh, that is is completely. Um, outsized what we've seen in the recent past. We've seen uh, the, we've been able to support year on year uh, systems that are, are doubling in terms of their uh, compute needs every three months. And so the focus of this lecture really is going to be about how we've been able to achieve this. Because the reason that I feel that hardware is such an important aspect of of this uh, part of research and and an application of deep learning is that if we had been unable in the last 10 years to uh, support this really rapid gain in um, compute capacity, then these systems would not have been able to be built. They would not have been able to be um, trained in reasonable times. And then there, and there's a certainly there's a, a giant jump in the, uh, in the rate in which we've been able to support compute um, in recent years. So, um, how I wanted to approach this was as follows, if I oh, turn drawing off. I have, I have a quick question from me, um, and I see another one from David, I'll just check, because uh, I'm finding what you're saying quite inspirational and interesting. One, one thing that, that I wanted to comment on is that from, from a software user's perspective, it feels like it was very opportune that deep learning came on along at this moment because in terms of the hardware world people had done a lot of stuff in terms of making video work quickly on mobiles and you know graphics processing units getting things going was there also you feel a window maybe because the way that the hardware community has steered towards implementing deep learning which i think is what you're going to talk about so quickly hmm. is it also potentially because there was a sort of what do we do next type moment for hardware as deep learning came along? I, I was curious about asking about that. Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is that you're right that there's, and I should have highlighted, there's, I think alongside all this work in deep learning is, is a, a, a parallel enormous amount of intellectual energy uh, in uh, computer architecture um, and, and also in system software to enable all of this. So, if, if, so for example, uh, if you've gone to a hardware conference before deep learning, you know, there maybe was the odd isolated machine learning type of, of, of paper. But now if you go there, all the venues have, you know, half of the papers are dedicated to understanding how they can do better, how they can, here's a new accelerator design, here's a new piece of software, a new, new technique that will enable these to be supported. So this is it's kind of like this really an explosion of interest um, because they, what they, I think, I think one of the key aspects here, and I'll get to this uh, in the slides, is that um, one of the key levers is parallelization. And then it just so happens that um, these uh, workloads are very parallelizable. And so one of the big gatekeepers to using parallelization is that, oh, how do I transform the, my workload into being parallelized? about parallelizable, there's often a very big jump and people you know, spend a, a lot of work in being able to make that jump. Here we have a case where we have a, a workload that's increasing exponentially. Basically, we can't get enough of it. People want to explore ideas very quickly. And the key sort of um, component to this is, is um, embarrassing, embarrassingly parallelizable. And so then we can take that problem off the, off the rack and focus on how do we build hardware to support that? How do we build like new techniques to make this thing go faster without the sort of big robot that, can't, that always exists or often exists in the workloads that, that we're interested in? Um, I think there's many answers to that question you just asked, but that's one that popped in my mind. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, okay, so then I want to start off by giving some hardware foundation and introduce um, I think two key pillar ideas I want to build everything around. There are many, many interesting ideas I could have, have picked, but I think the issues of, of parallelization and data movement are, the, uh, are two that are going to um, sort of stand up um, for a long time. They've been there for a long time looking backwards. Uh, so they're going to extend beyond just current hardware and so on. 
but I also want to give, have this opportunity to kind of just bringing everyone into um, on the same page in terms of the sort of the micro architectures and, and so on, at least at a very high level, because this is a bit of a transition from the prior um, type of content we've been talking about. Um, right, so then one answer to what's the, what, what really had changed in, in hardware and software that enabled us to exceed sort of these more law, Moore's Laws based boundaries uh, and, and power this sort of uh, incredible need of, again, doubling compute every three months for about 10 years is, is the act of specialization. So it's, the answer is very kind of um, plain, but if we, if you go, and here is three different types of chips that one might you try to use deep learning with. The CPU sits on your desktop, you can give it a try. GPUs, which we'll be talking about a lot, have been the um, the, the primary target in, in, in um, and certainly the initial target. And then as we've moved forward and as they've kind of, as the, the need for these, um, need for this has increased and people are willing to put in the dollars and effort to build custom built hardware, we have seen um, things like the TPU or, or basically custom built accelerators. And so the through line here is like, you know, where if you had to answer in one sentence, where did the gains come from? It's a very simple answer through um, specialization. So we have a specialized, um, We've speci specialized in the hardware, we've specialized the low level software, things that arrange things like matrix multiplication. And throughout the stack now, uh, we're increasingly changing different parts of it to, to focus uh, specifically on what's required for deep learning. And it's by those means that we can get um, bigger and bigger gains. Um, and of course, that may, there's, a, there's a side effect of that, and that is that these components are, use, uh, are not really largely useful for anything else but those things. And so that's something I'm gonna bring up. Um, Again, so then there are two points I want to sort of make in this, uh, as I sort of introduce what is kind of like dry material. Um, uh, that is um, the opportunity of parallelization and then uh, the issue, the challenge of dealing with data movement. So we're going to start off with uh, parallelization. Turn off this dry thing. I go down. So the, the, I want to choose some in the most familiar forms to you. Um, I saw the types of um, courses that are taken here in terms of computer architecture. So this will not be so brand new to, to any of you. Um, but if you're talking about processing in terms of um, you know, commodity, we have the CPU. It's, a, it's, it's basically the Swiss army knife type of processor. The microarchitecture is, is designed specifically to do really well on, on types of, of workloads, types of tasks that you're not going to be sure what they're going to be a priori. Uh, and so, as a, and so as a consequence, we spend most of the sort of the you know the area that we have in the, the microarchitecture on having that really intricate caches of memory. And as a consequence, we have a few number of cores, so we don't really have much of a chance of doing things in terms of of large parallelization. And I really was just showing this to contrast it with uh, that of a GPU. And then you have, and some of these kind of things I would mention would be true of many other types of accelerators that are going to try to leverage uh, heavily leverage parallelization, where we want to be able to um, break down the workload that we're going to um, uh, execute. So whether it's doing inference and uh, different parts of, of training, compute over mini batches and so forth, we want to be able to break them down and execute them, um, uh, execute different parts of them at the same time as much as possible. And then so if you look at um, an alternative type of microarchitecture, such as the GPU, there are a couple of um, really big takeaways here, you see the sort of much more compute cores. So although these are very stylized images, they look like they don't have much detail on them, the colors do actually matter. So if you go back and forth, we have green indicating these compute cores able to do, do work. Uh, we have uh, yellow being the control, and then we have purple being uh, local types of memory and, and, and further out. And so that what GPUs do is, is they really want to be able to uh, spend most of their sort of budget in terms of area on having a large amount of compute cores and then having a, um, a, a memory hierarchy that is, is fairly um, explicit. So you can be very hands-on about where things are going to be. Um, and you're doing all of this work so that uh, there's always uh, data close enough to the processes such that none of them are going to stall such that you can do many, much of the work all in parallel. Um, but with the overhead being that you have to very um, tightly control where things are going to be placed. Um, and you have a, a lot less control, um, you got a lot less implicit control on the on the chip itself. Um, now, so that's that's the, those are two very very polar um, opposite 
approaches to building a piece of hardware to run a run some execution. Um, the other issue, so that's that's so that's with respect to um, uh, parallelization. Now, with respect to data movement, um, we can't ignore that um, these uh, these pieces of hardware are going to exist in terms of full systems. We're going to have different types of components, um, primarily. Uh, different places where data is going to reside that are going to be connected by different buses running at different speeds. So this is going to be an issue that exists within the chip itself. So uh, you're going to have an issue of, of where does the data reside and how close is it to the chip and the speeds available to it, um, but also um, in communication from the from the piece of hardware you're going to use to do the processing to other places in the system. So this is it. So you, any type of system you have, so if it's in the data center, it's under your desk, um, there's going to be this issue of um, where is the data going to be? We have um, the data structures involved when uh, doing deep learning are uh, so large that you're never going to be able to keep it all, for example, uh, on chip, unless you're doing something kind of extraordinary in terms of techniques, but you're never going to have it there. You need to spread it out throughout the machine. And so the key issue with data movement is how are you going to minimize uh, the movement of data because that introduces latency and also energy. Um, and then it causes you to be unable to uh, make sure that the cores are not going to be stalling while they're producing the the, the work and to kind of make this a bit more concrete, um, I think the next slide really puts these numbers in 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 sort of greater context. So let me, yeah. Um, if I mean th this this sort of um, data movement issue would not be uh, such a big deal if it wasn't for the fact that uh, the, uh, the the scales change so greatly. So then, if you look at um, L1 cache, so there's uh, uh, data that's very close to the processing unit, um, but as a consequence has to also be uh, small. If you look at the difference between L1 and L2, which is also you know, relatively very close, but we're going to have a, a fourfold increase in uh, the amount of time it takes to access. Now then, if we compare L2 to um, something like main memory, where we're going to have um, you know, our largest bit of, of, of memory available to us, um, we're talking about a, a jump of uh, 25 times. Right, so it's huge. So suddenly, if, if, if I'm trying to do, compute on something and it's not in, in any one of these two caches, I have to go here, I have to wait uh, you know, a 25 time factor. Now, what happens uh, if I compare this to um, main memory to uh, what if it's on disk? Now, um, the data sets that we use obviously don't are so large, like ImageNet is something like 150 gigabytes. Um, so it's obviously gonna spill out onto things like SSD, unless you have something very um, unusual. And, and so then when we're in SSD, which is also a very fast um, form of stable storage, um, we're 160 times slower. So somehow we need to be able to do all this compute, uh, do it in parallel and manage this issue of data movement that exists. Uh, and we're gonna have tremendous pressure placed upon this problem because there's the size of the data structures. Uh, training sets, again, 150 gigabytes, not uncommon. Um, the models themselves, we describe them with weights. Um, you might have, say, AlexNet is, I think it's like 240 megabytes if you're not doing anything fancy to it. So the weights alone of that is going to really have to be spread across this, this memory hierarchy. Um, and that's what's, what's interesting is that, uh, commonly speaking, um, this memory hierarchy is going to follow this sort of pattern on things like CPUs and conventional pieces of hardware, where things close to the, the process are going to be small, they're going to be faster, uh, and then we're going to, um, the sizes get bigger but slower. The trick that um, things like GPUs are able to pull off that is so important is that they're able to have a small amount of memory um, placed close to a lot of different cores, right? So you might have 5,000 cores on a GPU. You might have, say, I don't know, depends how you count, but maybe you have eight cores on your on your CPU. If I have a tiny amount of memory associated with a huge amount of cores, then actually the, the amount of space that I have close to a particular type of compute unit um, is gonna be relatively much bigger than what I have here. So you have this, what's called an inversion of the, of the memory hierarchy in these uh, processes that are designed um, to do sort of you know, good parallel compute um, where you have this really interesting ability to have some you know, important information, very close, a lot more of it. Um, and then you also are typically designed to have main memory that is uh, potentially a bit smaller. So we see four gigabytes versus say, well, there's tens of gigabytes as you might see in a computer um, conventional computer, 
Um, but then the, the bandwidth available to access this is in this case, 10 times more. So these are common, these are common types of um, differences that you have in these computers that are, that are designed for doing really nice parallel compute. And then this is, this is just built on, on GPU examples because I feel this is important to kind of show given the, the prevalence of, of, of GPUs um, currently, especially for students. So there's, there's a, so there's the two main themes I want to talk about in the Halgo Foundations and then made more concrete through some pretty familiar artifacts. Um, now I want to move in and dive into parallelism itself. Um, and before I get there, I just want to speak a little bit about um, big trends as to why we, it's pushing us towards this. And then this, this is a figure that plots a number of different uh, important hardware trends long-term. So I guess we're back to the 70s. So shockingly, it's always a bit of a surprise to me, but if you go to the 70s, it's 50 years ago now. So, whoa. Um, but uh, there's two things I want you to look at. There's this blue series of patterns here. And this is showing an important story that if you haven't heard before, this is a flattening of performance, uh, at least in terms of um, sequential types of processing. As we start to reach um, sort of thermal and physical limits when we build these chips, there's a flattening of performance here that we've been seeing in the last 10 years. And so as a reason, as I was mentioning earlier, um, there's increased attention and usage of um, parallelism. So people are building chips where you have a lot more logical cores. And so you see this is being played out in this black line. So in this uh, long-term hardware trend where there's a lot more availability of logical cores within the process is because it's by leveraging these parallel cores that we can start to cheat the system and still have these nice big gains, even though we're kind of plateauing in this dimension here. Um, so I just wanted to kind of put this in context about why parallelism is so important. Um, and then, oh, I guess I haven't mentioned this so far, but one of the reasons why these slides are a, a real pain to make was that I had this idea of, uh, many of the concepts I'm telling you about when, when you have a chance, this is a Jupyter notebook, so when you have a chance to access it, um, you'll be able to play around with some of these concepts yourself. So, um, for example, through this uh, Jupyter notebook, you're going to be able to try different architectures out and see what would happen if you run them on a GPU or a CPU and so on. So uh, going through it, I don't know if I'll point them out all the time, but there is opportunity here to kind of try out these ideas also for yourself and that you can kind of play with different architectures and see what what, um, what happens. Um, but I guess the, 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 the remaining of these slides in this particular section are going to really be speaking towards why, um, why and how do we see this type of um, performance happening where the CPU is much slower and uh, the GPU is much faster? How does, the, how does the GPU pull this off and instantiating some of the kind of points I'll be making a little bit sketchily as we go along? Um, how are we doing for time? I think we're okay. So one, one, of, the, one of the big problems um, if you're going to try to play the parallelism game is that uh, often it's really hard for the workload to be broken down to nice chunks that can be executed at the same time. I, I think um, it's really important um, that we're, um, in the case of deep learning, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for parallelism. So I kind of want to just quickly sketch out a few of them. This equation here like uh, connects very tightly into what um, Farek was saying on, on Tuesday. This is just the equation for, for model update. Um, Kind of zoomed in while we have um, so parameters. Uh, so you, instead of uh, the model, um, model here is being referred to as theta, but you can imagine this being W. And there we have L being layers, I being the ith parameter within the model. So it's quite a zoomed in. This is a model update. So we have the initial starting point when we're kind of doing these steps through gradient descent. And then we're calculating gradients here um, with respect to this individual parameter where B is an individual element within the, um, the larger batch to calculate what the model update should be. So that's what we're looking at, the sort of zoomed in view of model update. And um, let's see some of the nice juicy opportunities for parallelism. So number one is in the calculation of these gradients. So whenever we want to calculate a gradient, we're going to have to calculate um, both forward pass um, as, we, as we compute the loss over different examples. They're going to require nice big fat matrix multiplications as you have the weight which is, a, is, a, is one matrix uh, um, multiplied by the input at different layers. Um, and then also, as you start to uh, go in the reverse direction, the backwards pass to calculate the gradients, you're gonna have the similar type of thing. Um, again, nice big matrices. So as we'll see later in these slides, you can break these matrices down really nicely to be executed in parallel on things like a GPU or similar. So that's 
opportunity number one, but there are others. Um, opportunity number two is uh, you can uh, yeah you can so you, you can calculate the individual gradients with respect to uh, um, each uh, example. Uh, it can be also done in parallel. You can um, as you're calculating different batches, right? So we have this nice big giant training set. We're going to break it into different batches as we're doing the optimization. You can calculate those batches in parallel. And with all of these, there will be um, there will be OPEs to pay as you might need to pause for, to do sort of some synchronization, depending on how close you want to adhere to the actual math of the equation. But, but something I would point out is these synchronization things. So for example, I might do a bunch of, I calculate a bunch of gradients and then want to sum them and so forth. That's what I'm talking about when you have to, at some point, maybe pause to make sure each of the individual ones have all been calculated and then collate that result before moving forward. Um, the nice thing with deep learning is it seems to be very tolerant to sort of relaxing some of these things. So you can do things such as, um, proceed with a model update, even though that you haven't got all the different individual updates from individual batches calculated and still have a, do a pretty good job and, and trade off perhaps a slightly worse um, optimization outcome um, through the increase in speed because you're again not waiting. Um, so it's a really nice um, property that people uh, can mathematically study, but you know, you empirically can, can see happening. Um, and, and finally, there are some trivial opportunities um, for parallelism. Uh, for example, as you're trying to determine all these different hyperparameters that have such a big effect in terms of the end accuracies of the models, um, things like initialization, what depth, all the different learning rates and so on, all of those can be treated as individual experiments that can be assigned to individual um, uh, you know, GPUs and done in, you know, in parallel um, trivially. Right, so then great, nice big collection of places that we can do things all at the same time. Uh, what happens if we assign them to a to a CPU is that it's sort of non, not surprisingly the opportunity for doing these things in parallel is very weak. You might have a small number of cores and threads. You can sort of branch these things across, but but really there's not really big opportunities for gains there. And this is just a, a piece of code that you can run later to see. Um, here is this, it's an MNIST uh, training example on on Lynette, a particular type of architecture. You could change the architecture and, and so forth, and you can see how the epochs uh, are going as you train them on a on a CPU. Um, now, in the case of, of GPUs, um, you know, broadly speaking, if they're not um, if those are non toy examples, um, what you're likely to do because the models are rather big. Um, you're going to have uh, you want to you want to fit it all on the GPU memory, um, where you have uh, at, at least one batch uh, and the and the state of the model all fitting inside uh, the GPU and then executing and then the matrix uh, multiplication is all going to be done in parallel. Uh, and the main reason that you want to have um, those sort of boundaries adhered to is the uh, the data movement effect because um, so for example. Um, once I've placed the, the data I'm going to compute on and the, and the model parameters I'm going to be updating and so forth inside the GPU, I mean, I have fantastic types of, of, of uh, um, memory access. So the, you know, the global memory within a GPU might be looking at 200 nanoseconds. Um, but then as soon as I need to leave that device and, and, and go out into anywhere else, such as SSD, um, you're going to have to use a much slower bus that is going to be something like 400 times slower. Right, so it, it, the whole thing is going to stall down. So you typically want to kind of um, uh, fit it all in one, uh, you know, fit the model, fit the model and the in uh, the batch uh, onto the GPU, and then parallelize across the different cores. Things like the matrix multiplications as you're doing the gradients and so on. Um, and there's some code that you can follow through. Um, but essentially you'll see that in this case, the, the GPU is much faster and you can play with, um, you know, obviously you, you can start to play with the different effects. So if I had a very tiny model, um, maybe some of the gains that I would expect to see from a GPU are gonna be less because um, you can't amortize the benefit of the GPU against the cost of moving it all onto the GPU to have, the, have it computed. So perhaps for some, for example, small data sets, small models, things like CPUs can still compete. But as, as soon as you start having rather large models, um, things like AlexNet and so forth, and, and, and those that are much larger, then you start to see the GPU um, start to, to really uh, take off. Um, and again, the idea is that you can experiment for yourself on that front. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, at least in terms of when you're doing the matrix multiplication, how does the GPU approach it? Um, 
Let's see. So what I wanted to say is that it, it, it performs matrix multiplication much differently to how you would uh, typically uh, see it um, I don't know, perform, maybe as described in high school, where you're doing the sort of row by row style approach to doing matrix multiplication. Um, what, what we really want to be able to do is, is divide what are typically huge matrices um, because you know, the weights describing from layer to layer can be, can be quite big as, and so are the inputs. And then what you want to do is be able to do what is called block multiplication, where you, you break down these matrices into individual blocks and you assign them to different parts of the GPU. And the objective, the, the sort of overarching objective is about having none of these cores stored. They're all doing useful work and such that we can um, divide the matrix of the, the matrix multiplication and assign all of it to um, individual what are called, perhaps confusingly, there's different terminology for this, but if you use the CUDA style of terminology, you're called these um, blocks. So you have these thread blocks within the GPU. So you you have the sort of you have the sort of hierarchical arrangement of the of the many cores that are available. You arrange them into what are called thread blocks. Inside each thread block is an individual uh, processing unit. You can call this thread, and then. Um, you'll break down the matrix multiplications into these individual blocks and assign each block to a different thread block. And your objective is, is within one logical step, have each individual block computed such that you can do all of you know, what is you know, a huge matrix multiplications in one logical jump. And then the way that we do that is that within each of the uh, thread blocks, you have individual threads that are assigned the um, rows. And then uh, the, there's a lot of um, data movement benefit from being able to load in uh, all of the data that pertains to some individual block that you assigned to the thread block into uh, this shared memory of the thread block. Let's call this shared memory. Oh, maybe I should have done that, but that is, uh, that is very fast and uh, globally available to all um, cores within the thread block. Individual threads also have memory, and so they'll have the state necessary for computing the individual um, rows. And then what's what, what's important is the sizing. So based on how much memory I have available in the hierarchy of the GPU, and then based on what the actual size of the matrices are, I you know, very carefully decide on the sizes such that when that um, when the individual cores need to compute the, each stages of the, the matrix multiplication, they never stall because everything they need is close at hand. And it'd be a disaster if I need to, uh, you know, calculate some element, and I, and I find that oh, okay, the last element couldn't fit inside there, has to live here, and then everything is going to wait until that's finished. And then so that, and um, that's essentially the design sort of space that people have when they consider how to use a, a GPU very fast uh, to do matrix multiplication. Um, I want to make sure we get through the material. Okay, um, now. On Tuesday, we had this question of batch size and how this aligns to memory, and should we use multiples of two and so forth. And so I wanted to just put this, these set of figures in here, but I, you know, I will only speak about this one here. Um, and so essentially, this is a real GPU. Um, when we're deciding these different, uh, this is the same issue, but in a, in a different context, uh, we're going to pick, in this case, one of the dimensions of this uh, matrix multiplication blocking exercise. So you have this sort of, what's the size of the block going to be and what are the different dimensions? And then that relates very strongly to the amounts of memory we have in the different parts of the, uh, the GPU hierarchy. And th that was all to summarize um, what we see, the actual sort of manifest behavior in a real device. So we have on the y-axis, we have flops. So floating um, operations per second. You can think of this as a kind of the throughput like what's the what's the pressure? What's the throughput out of this uh, you know powerful device? And what we only want to do is have really nice high utilization. That's what happens when we have all the cores humming. They're never stalling. They're never waiting. Um, and then what we can see here is that uh, there are these magic numbers, I guess, that align nicely with the memory hierarchy that you can see happening. And that's when we have high um, uh, throughput. And then whenever we pick some values uh, that do not nicely align with the memory hierarchy, it's possible. You can do it. Um, but as a consequence, because you have sort of underfill in certain parts of the memory, then you're going to have stalling. Uh, you're going to have um, cores. I uh, know you're going to sorry. You have threads in the thread block that are underutilized. They haven't got any useful work to do because of the alignment of the memory. And that's what you see happening here. So you, you, you nail this like useful parts of the, the memory, high throughput, anything else you can still do, but you have like this massive underutilization where I need to kind of assign blocks uh, 
due to memory, but they're, un, they're unable to fulfill the cause to have useful work done in, in some. So this, it's, it's, it's a really interesting game to play in terms of getting good performance out. People spend a lot of time on it. Um, and because of deep learning, it's become actually very valuable. Um, so I thought that was an interesting empirical sort of result. Um, what, what I want to do now is connect what has been a very zoomed in image of what an individual GPU is doing in terms of just matrix multiplication and then start to build outwards again because um, to get the types of um, high performance we need to train things like trillion um, parameter models and so forth that you might have read about uh, can't be done by one machine. And so what we need to do is stack GPUs, uh, multiple GPUs uh, or multiple accelerators of any kind really within a host and then also connect those hosts together. So if you consider just the, the multi-GPU case, uh, we have a very uh, strong parallels existing within this uh, questions of what do we parallelize and how do we parallelize it? The same way that we consider, okay, what can we parallelize in terms of one single core? We're presented with similar problems of like, well, what are we gonna parallelize across different GPU cards? Um, so you might have, if you have multiple GPU cards, uh, common types of arrangement would be, for example, to have um, different batches being computed by the different cards. And interestingly, the, the factors that shape those decisions are also based on, again, the amount of uh, data movement time and cost and overhead that occurs to try to have these things all working in parallel and aligned also with how much memory you have in individual uh, ones. Now, um, it's really lovely how you can have the same sort of set of core sort of questions being asked in terms of multi GPU cards in the same box or when you have connect and this is just some code you can use to see this happening, you can have you can add some, you can have um, multiple GPU cards, this is this, this code would work if you do have it available to you, you can see what the speed would be. Um, and then you have the same issues again occurring when you have multiple um, machines all connected together. And so I guess I would just want to, yeah, this is a good place to, to discuss a little bit further. Um, when you're in this place, when you're in this space and you need to be in this area and arranging your, your sort of your workloads in this way, if you're kind of scaling this thing up to these very large uh, models or, or training sets, you know, two common sort of um, paradigms exist. Um, one is, is that of um, what is called model parallelism. So that you would run into this, for example, if you have these ginormous models that are um, going to be uh, larger than the, the um, global memory of your GPU or accelerator. And then you're faced with the issue of having to, um, to span them across uh, multiple kind of um, compute units. Uh, and so you can do that by what's called model, model parallelism. And so this illustration is actually fairly authentic in that you would have individual um, uh, yeah, compute workers uh, performing work on different uh, parts of the model. Now, the interesting thing is because of the architecture, because of the way that the models are sort of wired up, there are gonna be dependencies, meaning that one uh, unit can't start work until the other. This, for example, this guy is gonna be unable to do work until this one uh, performs the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the um, necessary steps in earlier parts of the model, depending on how it's connected. So I need to do sort of early layers before I can do any work in later layers. Um, so that can be a big problem, but so the, um, the way that we can uh, overcome this, because what can, ha what can happen again is this issue of stalling. We, now we have it on a much bigger scale. We've gone from sort of stalling individual cores of a GPU all the way to stalling occurring in individual machines that maybe have uh, more than one unit in, in them, for example. Um, the way we can overcome this is with this notion of uh, pipelining. Luckily, we always want to train on more and more data. So in this example, where I'm waiting for, um, what I, I otherwise might be waiting for um, this, uh, this worker to finish, what I can do is be computing the same earlier parts of the model on an earlier example. So I could have you know, like example one, so like on a B1 plus one, I have an earlier B, and, that's, and, and by 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 um, by computing the model updates uh, in the in the in the state needed for uh, an individual um, part inside the model, while this one is working on a different example, I can pipeline them together and have them all working at the same time. Um, the other type of, um, of 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 parallelism paradigm when you're talking about multiple machines working together is that of data, where simply you just um, you um, spread the data across different machines. You can calculate gradients independently and then bring them all together. Um, but very similarly to how I mentioned earlier where there's a chance, there's opportunities for parallelism in terms of the gradients to be computed independently. Um, 
in, in, in the sort of sort of macro scale view of, of, of uh, deep learning systems, um, there are two key sort of uh, challenges that kind of can summarize many of the issues I've been talking about, and that is um, those of synchronization and communication. But again, I, I like the fact that this aligns to challenges of both of parallelism and data movement. So um, this illustration does a good job. You have individual machines doing work. You're computing gradients. There's going to be a gradient exchange, but you can have individual machines perhaps can lag. Then you have faced with this issue. So number one is this communication. I have to wait for the data to be actually um, transferred. And these are non-trivial types of delays because remember this um, memory hierarchy um, and, and data movement uh, slide earlier where we had these huge... Um, we had huge jumps even inside the machine, right? So I remember this 160 times uh, jump from memory to SSD. You'll see similar jumps or worse in terms of uh, networking between machines. So that can, it's one issue of, of delay. The other is this issue of synchronization. Am I going to proceed even though I don't have all the information from all the workers? Because if I, if I wait, I can be um, entirely authentic to the, to the design of the algorithm. If I don't wait, um, well, then I can, um, I do so much better in terms of performance because I'm not going to be stalling. I can fully utilize, this, the name of the game is, is utilization. I can fully utilize uh, the available hardware I have available to me. Now, to be honest, I'm running a little low on time. Um, this is just a code example of parallelism. I want to just, so I'll, I guess I'll spend uh, five minutes on data movement and then five minutes on, on closing questions and then it'll end at three, so it's fine. Okay. So these, these first few slides are just, uh, these are um, code snippets that you can run through yourself on different types of architectures. These happen to be for a particular architecture, Lynette, that I calculated. The, 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 um, some of the messaging here is that um, this is, this is, this is um, quantifying some of the things I've been saying namely um, things like uh, the data structures such as the weights, the activations and so on that need to be calculated during training can get very large. Um, so this is just putting numbers to that uh, discussion. And then it's introducing this concept of working set that I think ties nicely into earlier classes you would have seen um, where the working set here for a deep learning model uh, includes the weights, the biases, and the activations. And so then we have to deal with uh, the pressures on data movement and bandwidth between components in our system um, as those you know, relatively large uh, data structures need to be moved uh, back and forth. And so then the, the example here about um, uh, there is a variation from layer to layer um, that can be very significant. So you can see, for example, from one layer to the next in, in this particular model I've, I've selected, you can see that there is maybe a, a factor of probably like 10 uh, in terms of the bandwidth needs from layer to layer. And so they're designing a system that is going to have high utilization, so where things are not delayed, uh, where you're still getting the most out of your cores, when you have such variation from layer to layer, is a further complication. Um, but let me get, I just want to get to the point these are some nice codes that you can run through, but I want to get to this point. And so, so far I've discussed a lot about in the, of, of you know, um, design approaches that are really grounded within the, this, um, within GPUs. Um, I want to kind of eke in to um, more bespoke types of design that are related to, uh, to accelerators. And so one of the, um, and, the, the, and where the design here, again, is, is um, chiefly trying to combat the issue of data movement. And so there is this um, design uh, called uh, systolic arrays, where the concept is that you want to minimize uh, uh, the cost of data movement and the, um, the, the negative effects in terms of throughput that they can um, provide by chaining your um, uh, processing units uh, together, such that the output of one flows directly into the input of the other. And so this example here, this is actually taken from the original paper that proposed this method. There's a, there's a true legend um, called H.T. Uh, Kung, who, uh, who was at the time at CMU. So in the 80s, he and others uh, proposed this, this approach called um, systolic arrays that have proven to be very uh, attractive for, for deep learning. Um, yeah, where the notion is that you chain your processing units very tightly so the output of one goes into the input of the next and so that you can then you can um, uh, 
uh, have much higher throughput because you're not having to go back to main memory. And then see what and what is interesting is that you can also design not just these pipeline versions of these um, processing units, but then you can have these 2D uh, arrangements. So where you can have uh, this, excuse the drawing, but um, essentially you can have a very tightly packed um, what is often often very simple processing units, meaning they you know they don't they do very specific task. So meaning that they don't mean need very many transistors to build them. So you can densely pack them and have a lot of them, um, where they can have they can um, pass data directly to the adjacent um, processing units. And so then um, these are fan the, the 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 downside is that they are um, very poor at, at executing sort of any sort of arbitrary thing you're going to give them because they're not going to be well suited to it. But you can hardwire them together um, so that they support specific types of compute very well. And uh, one of those is matrix um, multiplication. And so this um, this uh, video to the right is going to be able to show um, what happens when you have uh, uh, the inputs of um, uh, the inputs to a matrix multiplication, where you have the other other side of the you know, the other input um, sitting already inside the uh, processing units, because that's the approach you typically want to take. So you minimize the data movement there, and then you can see that because um, how uh, how um, this approach, this design to arranging the processing units can compute matrix uh, multiplication. So then you um, this is showing it, it from the very initial stage, the sort of the cold start stage before everything is initialized. Um, but what you'll see is that uh, well the objective is to populate here a series of of Y outputs that are going to be the different elements for the output of the, the matrix multiplication. Um, w are the weights in this case the other side of the, the input and then we have X arriving as X arrives into um, the first PE unit. Let me just show you. It immediately can calculate the um, the, the multiplication. It's going to uh, um, give that output to the next element uh, next to it. And um, when the when the uh, x two value arrives at this element here, it's initially going to do. It's going to be able to do two steps at once. It's going to um, take the input that it's received from the uh, p next to it, uh, as well as uh, compute the um, multiplication of this uh, particular element here. So you can see this happen. And, and so, so from, from two P um, executions, we already have the, um, the uh, we already have both the W1, um, W12 and X2 multiplied and summed together. Now, if we, as we progress further, you can see that in that same stage, it got passed down to this element and it's so essentially in a series of in, in a series of steps requiring no memory accesses, we are doing both uh, multiplication and addition to populate the um, uh, the output of the matrix multiplication. And so this design is is quite a bit different to that of of a GPU. Uh, you see that the, the kind of the explicit assignment to uh, of memory to different parts of uh, of a hierarchy to have th high throughput is not necessary. Um, and uh, but that some of the some of the benefits, uh, some of the drawbacks is that it's unable to do anything really much uh, else other than matrix multiplication and very similar types of, of workloads. Um, so while the while the GPU is obviously able to do a lot more flexible types of parallel tasks, um, I'm just going to skip this because I don't want to uh, go over time. This, this essentially is just talking about the issue of where do you put your weights? So in that case, we had an example where the weights were based inside the HPE, uh, but depending on uh, what is the thing that's going to change. Um, so for example, if, if my weights are gonna be constant as I, as I stream it over a large number of examples, it might make sense to leave, make the weights um, stored inside the PEs. But for example, if I'm going to have um, uh, changing the model, I might be trying lots of variations of my model against a certain example. I could have the example stored inside the PEs. That's that's one example um, design question inside accelerators. But what I want to do is get to this because this is um, this is a particular accelerator, the TPU. This is version one designed by Google. I picked it because I suspected many of you might have seen it before. It's one that you actually you actually can have access to. So while there are thousands of accelerators proposed every year, this is one that you can actually just 
uh, jump into Colab, I think even, and gain access to it. And you can see many of these generic um, design uh, aspects I've been discussing are already existing within it. So, so for example, um, it, you can see that the Satolic array that I talked about here uh, is, is part of this design. Uh, we also see this overall uh, aim of highly specialized um, uh, hardware design uh, being very apparent in this when you consider this versus a GPU. Everything here has been designed solely to be able to do um, in this case, inference, but in versions uh, two and three of the TPU, both uh, also training um, for neural networks. So you see, for example, computational blocks, not only so the, the most flexible one is the systolic array that can do different types of matrix multiplication, but then you have, for example, compute blocks here that are specifically put to do um, pooling, normalization, activation, where you're going to do element-wise multiplication, because you know that's all you need to do for that particular um, stage. You also see a memory hierarchy that's completely built around the, the logic uh, that we want to support. So unlike TPUs that are very flexible but explicit, you have to tell it where it's going to put things. Here we have data structures that, that are designed with expectation of what the general size is going to be and the different types of components. So you have, for example, a very large place for activations. Activations are going to be a, a big component when you're doing inference. And you can see that, that the speed between um, the weights to the, to the um, systolic array is much slower because we can afford it to be slower because we expect that while the, we're going to pump a lot of data, a lot of examples through this type of system, so we need that path to be very uh, speedy. We're okay to use our sort of resources, our transistor resources to enable that to be ha uh, possible. Um, we don't care nearly as much about the speed between setting the weights of the model because we're not going to do that very diff fre frequently. We're going to have often the same model used um, multiple times. Um, now some closing messages, but I think it might be worth just taking a few questions instead, and um, I can uh, write up some notes about what these other um, messages were at the end um, for folks. Because I see we're approaching three questions. So Nick, um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, there was a, an earlier question that I re copied into the chat. Uh, it's basically David asks the question whether the introduction of dedicated AI cards um, essentially locks in neural networks uh, as a solution, like whether, whether you think that's a good direction. And I think it's particularly in like phones and laptops and various like user devices, the fact that we now see these neural processing units and whatever they are branded. Um, uh, whether you think there is a risk of limiting innovation because now everything has to work according to these hardware. I think that's the nature of the question. I mean, to a degree, although you'd be surprised how agile people are willing to, you know, if there was, if there were, it depends on what, what the issue is. If it's about, um, if, if they were, I would say if there was a new model or a new approach to this, because many of this is, much of this is predicated on the sort of uh, structure of deep learning, but if there was new things came along, there's enough um, value in the system that in a, in a few years we could change the chips, I think. It depends on what the, you know, how, how large the change was. Um, chips are already, I mean, one of the chief problems is, is building a, a, a specialist uh, processor like the one I just mentioned uh, and having it accommodate all the new exciting ideas that are coming out and doing well. So what, what happens very often is that you might have a particular new idea um, where you might even by hand calculate how many operations it's going to take, but then you put it on a piece of hardware and it's much slower than in, um, than existing designs. And that's because the, the hardware and the software stack has been completely um, optimized at making those assumptions. So you have basically less efficient solutions running much faster because that's what the stack assumes. Um, so with, I mean, I think that's just a natural, it's a natural uh, product of, of, of trying to try to support what's working. Um, and then I guess, I guess if, if we had um, alternatives that we became very attracted to, we would just shift over time. But I think it, the one thing it does, um, one thing it does limit is the, the research exploration. So then if folks, you know, if, if it's much harder for me to try idea X than idea Y, because idea X is too different to what the software currently supports, then you know, I can't do things like